Okay. Uh, my name is Michael Collins and I'm the Director General of the IIEA, the Institute of International and European Affairs, and I'm pleased, very pleased indeed, to welcome you all uh, for this IIEA webinar, which is co-organised with the European Parliament Liaison Office here in Ireland. Uh, with the deadline for extending the UK's post-Brexit transition period now passed, the negotiations between the EU and the UK have taken on, obviously, a new urgency. MEPs will have a vital role to play in the process as an agreement on the future relationship can only enter into force if it is approved by both the European Parliament and the European Council. We're absolutely delighted this afternoon to be joined by David McAllister, MEP, Chair of the European Parliament Foreign Affairs Committee and Chair of its UK Coordination Group. Uh, David has been generous enough to take time out of his schedule to speak with us and to be with us this afternoon. Uh, David is an important German and EU voice uh, with a distinguished career in EU and German politics. He has been an MEP since 2014 and has been a Vice President of the European People's Party since 2015. He has held a variety of political offices in Germany, including Minister President of Lower Saxony, and we at the Institute of International European Affairs were delighted to welcome him previously in November 2016. A lot of water under the bridge since then. David will speak to us for about 15-20 minutes or so and then we will go to your Q&A. Uh, you will be able to join the discussion using the Q&A function on Zoom which you should see on your screen. Oh. Please feel free to send your questions in throughout the session as they occur to you oh, and we will come to them once David has finished his presentation. Just if you would like to tweet and we would encourage you to do so please use the handle at IIEA. And just a reminder that both today's presentation and the Q&A are on the record. With that, David, again, a very, very warm Cade Mina Falsha. 100,000 welcomes to Ireland, to the IAEA. Thank you for joining us. The floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, Michael Collins. And uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for participating and showing uh, interest. Uh, I'm happy to have the opportunity of this conversation, which takes place during the fifth round this week of the negotiations on the future EU-UK relations. Now you all, especially in Ireland, followed with great interest the high-level meeting on the 15th of June. Both sides at that time agreed to inject new dynamics in the talks, or as the UK Prime Minister put it, to put the tiger in the tank. Now since this high-level meeting on the 15th of June, the negotiators and their teams have met three times, once for a restricted round of negotiations in the week of the 29th to the 3rd of July in Brussels, and twice for two specialised sessions that took place in the weeks of the 6th of July and the 30th of July, all in preparation for this fifth negotiating round, which has now started on Monday. In my opinion, and I think my opinion is shared by many of my colleagues in Brussels, the European Union is engaging constructively and in line with the mandate entrusted to the European Commission by the Council with support of the European Parliament. And let me add, fully in line with the political declaration, everything that this declaration was negotiated line by line by the EU and the UK government is contained in the EU strategy. However, not everyone in Brussels is of the opinion that the UK government is showing the same level of commitment. May I add, unfortunately, core divergences remain between the two sides on governance, the level playing field and fisheries. And we will have to see if this fifth negotiating round will bring a major breakthrough. Now, Michael Collins already mentioned the role of the European Parliament. The European Parliament's resolution in these negotiations is clear. In June, we voted with an overwhelming majority, a resolution on the negotiations for a new agreement with the UK, with 574 votes in favour, 34 against, and 91 abstentions. With this resolution, with this report, we prove that the Parliament continues to stand united behind the Chief Negotiator, Michel Barnier, and the mandate given 
to him by the council and fully in line with the political declaration. Today, I would like to focus on three main issues. First, the implications of a no deal scenario at the end of the transition period. Second, the progress or rather the lack of progress in the ongoing negotiations. And third, the implementation of the withdrawal agreement and in particular, the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland. Now on the first point, whatever is agreed or not, there will be a significant change as of the 1st of January. Even if the European Union and the United Kingdom conclude a highly ambitious partnership covering all areas agreed in the political declaration by the end of this year, the UK's withdrawal from the EU are key, the internal market and the customs union at the end of the transition period will inevitably create barriers to trade and cross-border exchanges that don't exist today. It is the UK government that has decided that the chosen form of partnership with the EU will be based on a free trade agreement and not on any closer form of association, such as a customs union. So the EU's message to businesses in the EU 27 member states, and I think I'm talking less about Ireland because you are fully aware of all these consequences, but the message of the EU to businesses in the other 25, 26 member states has been very clear. As of the 1st of January next year, the trading situation between the EU and the UK will completely change. By its nature, a free trade agreement will never be equivalent to frictionless trade, as we stated in paragraph 32 of our European Parliament's resolution. There will be broad and far-reaching consequences for public administrations, for businesses and citizens as of the 1st of January next year, regardless of the outcome of the negotiations. If an FTA is concluded, the changes might be less stark. Nevertheless, the administrative solution for customs, sanitary, phytosanitary and other product compliant checks will be completely different since the UK will become a third country. Two weeks ago, the European Commission issued a communication on readiness at the end of the transition period. I know from many talks with the Commission and with Michel Barnier that there are still a number of economic operators that are not fully aware of the consequences of the EU leaving the single market and the customs union. Therefore, the Commission's recent update of the readiness and preparedness notices is essential to avoid serious disruption at the end of the transition period. In parallel, the European Commission is reviewing and, where necessary, updating all original 102 stakeholder preparedness notices published at the time of the withdrawal negotiations, many of which continue to be relevant for the end of the transition period. Of course, the European Parliament will continue to be involved as a co-legislator in adopting any necessary contingency measures and accompanying legislation that would ensure that businesses continue operating with a high degree of legal certainty as of the 1st of January. Whatever the outcome of the negotiations might be, we stand ready to act very fast. Now, businesses will need time to prepare for the changes to the customs, regulatory and VAT excise regimes, but the full application of the protocol as of the 1st of January 2021 necessarily implies. For businesses in Northern Ireland, and you are very well familiar of this, this will include the introduction of customs procedures and formalities for goods entering Northern Ireland from Britain, and for goods leaving Northern Ireland for Britain, the introduction of regulatory checks and controls, including sanitary and phytosanitary controls for goods entering Northern Ireland from Britain, the introduction of prohibitions and restrictions in respect of goods entering Northern Ireland for Britain and for goods leaving Northern Ireland for Britain, and many, many more things. So this will be also mean a major change for Northern Ireland to avoid disruptions of business activity, the UK should urgently engage with the business community in Northern Ireland 
as businesses there must be able to prepare for the new requirements well in advance the commission services have stated that they are available to provide any assistance that may be required now the second point the progress or to be more precise the lack of progress in the negotiations the meetings of the chief negotiators and their teams in various formats over the past three weeks haven't achieved the desired success. The UK government, unfortunately, didn't, much, didn't match up to the level of commitment of the EU side to look for a solution for the most sensitive areas. I still hope to see concrete progress at this next round of negotiations this week. We are witnessing and still now, no real advancements from the UK side. The clock is ticking to reach a deal in the interests of our citizens and businesses. At this stage, the UK side needs to make real and concrete openings. Otherwise, the negotiations will remain at a standstill despite efforts to advance. As a European Union, our position remains based on the political declaration to continue to insist on parallel progress in all areas. The European Parliament was very clear once again in our latest resolution that we will continue not to accept any form of the famous cherry picking. Parliament's position is that we are ready to agree to an ambitious, modern and wide reaching FTA with the UK, but it is conditional on first comprehensive binding and enforceable provisions related to the level playing field. Second, the agreement must include a complete, sustainable, balanced and long-term fisheries agreement. And third, a robust, single, coherent and solid governance system as an overarching framework with the Court of Justice of the EU as the sole interpreter of EU law provisions. There is no other third country to which the European Union has proposed a fully tariff-free, quota-free trading deal. This is exceptional. However, this comes at a certain price. This has to be accompanied by level playing field provisions. In terms of WTO rules, the EU can only justify this access by corresponding obligations, otherwise, other third countries could request similar ac market access from the EU. To be very clear, and I'm often on British media and sometimes criticized for this, our rules are not dogmatic. They are simply a guarantee to protect the interests of our businesses and our citizens against unfair competition. The extremely tight negotiations timeline that the UK government itself has imposed is another reason why the deal has to be with zero quotas and zero tariffs. Recent trade negotiations have shown that tariff line by tariff line negotiations could take several years, which simply isn't possible. The UK has voluntarily chosen to leave our single market. And it is impossible that a third country has access to the internal market benefits without being subject also to its obligations. So for example, issues such as mutual recognition of professional qualifications for regulated professions or unlimited freedom to provide services simply cannot be negotiated as part of a free trade agreement. Many integration mechanisms of the EU internal market exist benefiting companies and individuals, to mention the most visible ones, such as Roman regulation on mobile charges or harmonized mechanisms for authorizing medicine products or chemical substances. However, only being a full member of the internal market can guarantee access to all these instruments. Now concerning the governance of our future agreement, the European Union stands strong behind its demand for an overarching governance framework which fully preserves the autonomy 
of the EU's decision-making and legal order. The Court of Justice of the European Union in Luxembourg should be the sole interpreter of EU law. This is a constitutional requirement, not a negotiation position. The European Union cannot conclude an international agreement that refers to EU law concepts and rules, for example, on data protection, but which does not preserve the Court of, European, Court of Justice of the European Union's role when it comes to disputes on interpretation. If we don't cater for this in the agreement, we will all be in serious legal trouble. Moreover, an alternative dispute settlement mechanism could only be envisaged if it guarantees independence and impartiality to the CJEU in line with the case law. Of course, similarly, the agreement should not restrict the autonomy of the British legal system. And finally, my third point on the implementation of the withdrawal agreement. The implementation of the withdrawal agreement is crucially important for the negotiations for our future relationship. It remains the yardstick for the UK's commitment to the negotiations with the EU. A new partnership can only be built on the foundations of a faithful and effective implementation of the withdrawal agreement. Of course, I cannot address a mainly Irish audience without discussing the implementation of the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland. Very early on, the negotiations ahead of the UK's withdrawal from the EU, both the UK and the EU acknowledged the unique situation of Ireland and Northern Ireland. They agreed that a specific solution was needed to reconcile the different interests at place. The solution in the end was found in the form of the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland, which of course you all very well know. As not being Irish, but German and half British, I am very cautious regarding the implementation of the withdrawal agreement, and I can assure you that the European Parliament will continue to scrutinize this aspect of the negotiations closely. In the UK coordination group, we regularly meet with Maros Shevchevich to be informed about the latest rounds of the Joint Committee. And it's thanks to Irish colleagues like Mairead McGuinness and Sean Kelly that I am very well aware of the technical complexity and the political sensitivity of this issue. So I would like to just make four points clear. First, on the UK paper on the protocol on Ireland and Northern Ireland, the UK counterparts have shared a good cooperation spirit during the second meeting of the Specialised Committee that took place on the 16th of July, and some progress was recorded on technical issues, but there are still lots to be settled if we want to move from aspiration to operation, such as customs procedures on goods entering Northern Ireland, the necessary IT requirements for the VAT system to be operational, and more importantly, the presence of the EU representatives in Northern Ireland. The issue of exit declarations is an old point of friction. The Irish Protocol preamble states that, quote, nothing in this protocol prevents the UK from ensuring unfettered market access for goods moving from Northern Ireland to the rest of the UK's internal market. And the same commitment is repeated in Article 6. However, it is clear that this refers only to goods moving from Northern Ireland to Britain. The promise of unfettered access is qualified. So nothing in this protocol can prevent unfettered access, the text says, but other obligations might, such as the EU's customs code, which requires an exit declaration. The second point, on the need to have a detailed timeline of measures for the application of the Irish protocol. We continue to demand assurances from the UK government about what measures and detailed timelines it intends to take on the timely and efficient implementation of the Irish protocol. The protocol must be fully operational on the 1st of January next year. It is therefore of paramount importance for the UK to further intensify the technical engagement to resolve all outstanding questions and to take the necessary practical actions without any delay. I am glad that at the meeting of the specialized committee that took place on the 16th of July, the UK has now engaged in technical discussions covering 
the full array of issues under the protocol. Now, third, on the preparation of the important decisions that are due to be taken by the Joint Committee before the end of the transition period, the Joint Committee will need to flesh out some important decisions concerning the application of the protocol before the end of this year, such as further defining processing for the purpose of assessing that goods brought into Northern Ireland from outside the European Union will not be subject to commercial processing in Northern Ireland, establishing the other criteria to be applied for considering that goods brought from Northern Ireland from outside the European Union are not at a risk of subsequently being moved into the European Union, and very important for the EU, determining the practical working arrangements relating to the exercise right of EU representatives to be present during the activities of the UK authorities regarding the application of EU law. I think it's positive that the last week's meeting of the Joint Committee was constructive and the UK government has shown commitment to resolve these issues. Still more needs to be done. And finally, I do hope that an agreement can be found quickly on all institutional agreements, such as the establishment of a technical office of the European Commission in Belfast. I understand that such a permanent presence is a sensitive matter as regards domestic politics in Northern Ireland. So the European Union should assure that we are talking about a simple technical back office and not a diplomatic presence. And finally, in addition to the Irish protocol implementation, the European Parliament remains very vigilant on citizens' rights issues covered by the withdrawal agreement. And this also, of course, matters for Northern Ireland. So to conclude on a positive or a cautiously positive note, I still remain hopeful that in the interest of companies and citizens on both sides of the channel and on both sides of the Irish Sea, we will manage to find an agreement and avoid the more serious disruptions expected in case of a no deal. This fifth and this sixth negotiating round will now be crucial. The ball is once again in the British court and we will continue to support Michel Barnier, who's doing an excellent job with his team for the Commission on behalf of our member states. Thank you for your attention and now I'm happy to look forward to an interesting Q&A session. Thank you very much, David, for that lucid and uh, very informative uh, presentation. We really do appreciate the clarity of it and the, uh, the firmness of it too. Um, just before we come to the Q and A, just uh, you know, you, as you say, you're half half German and half half, half British, and uh, I think I remember meeting you at one stage shortly after uh, the Brexit decision in 2016. And uh, just very mindful of this uh, mixed heritage that you have, but just on a personal level, how how difficult has this saga been for? Now, I don't describe the, this saga, this this whole uh, Brexit um, um, issue been for you on a personal level, you know, given your, your your mixed heritage, as it were. Well, thank you, Michael, uh, for asking. Well, I'm uh, 49 years old, uh, married. To my wife and I, we have two daughters, and we live in a small town in North Germany. Um, I grew up in West Berlin. My father was with the British military uh, in West Berlin during his final posting before he got retired. And so I was born British in the British military hospital in West Berlin, uh, but I also have German citizenship. Uh, my home country is Germany. Uh, we speak German at home with our children. But of course, I'm uh, fully aware of my uh, British heritage and I still hold a British passport like many others, but this is not only the case for people who hold a British passport. I am still very, very sad that the United Kingdom has left the European Union on the 1st of February. Uh, there's nothing positive about Brexit, but we have to accept political reality, and now we have to make the best out of the situation. Um, I have I know many UK politicians throughout all the different political parties, the Conservatives, the Labour Party, uh, also uh, a number of politicians in Scotland where my dad originally came from. Uh, he was born 1919 in, in Glasgow. Um, as a German citizen with a British background and a, as a convinced European, I just still really believe that in the EU of 27 member states, 
of 28 member states would be better than 27 member states uh, without the UK. But no country is hit so hard uh, like Ireland. And that's why I really found it impressive how the other 26 member states have shown solidarity uh, with the Republic. And um, your former Taoiseach, uh, Leo Varadkar, for instance, I know from many conversations with my Chancellor and Party Leader, Angela Merkel, was uh, very helpful in explaining her the sensitivity and the complexity of the Irish Northern Irish um, border. So that's what's what I, I can tell you. Um, I just do hope that we will find an agreement until the 31st of October, because that is technically the deadline, as Michel Barnier has pointed out. The UK will remain an important neighbor, an important trade partner, and for my home country, Germany, a very important political partner in G7, in G20, or in NATO. Uh, uh, thank you very much for that, David. I could ask you um, uh, a question that's just come in here from Pat Cox, who's of course former member of the uh, European Parliament, former president of the European Parliament. He's also an IAEA uh, board member um, and as uh, a former president of the European Parliament. And he says, at this late stage, uh, are the only effective options um, a free trade area agreement with no tariffs and quotas uh, subject to the conditions referred to? or alternatively, a hard exit based on WTO tariff schedules? And how late is too late to avoid the WTO option? Well, the UK has now decided that they will definitely leave on the 1st of January, on the 31st of December. They will leave the customs union, the single market. Everyone knew that if the UK had requested to extend the transition period, we wouldn't have said no but they have categorically ruled this out. Michel Barnier has several times said that for him, latest on the 31st of October, we need a, a ready text technically negotiated uh, by the two teams. So this uh, increases the time pressure, which has already been um, enormous. Um, the option is still that we want a comprehensive agreement with the United Kingdom, with the free trade agreement being at its core. We want a single agreement with an overarching single governance framework. Um, this has a lot to do with the experiences the European Union has made, for instance, with Switzerland, where our relations are based on, I guess now more than a hundred uh, agreements, which has made things even more complicated. So we want a single, comprehensive agreement and an FTA at its core and at its, as its base. I would, well, it's always difficult to predict the outcome, but I guess it's, well, at this stage, nobody can predict if we will find an agreement or not. I tried to point out in my initial statement that a lot now depends if the UK is ready to um, follow the commitments the UK government made and the political declaration. That is the way forward, especially now where we're under such enormous time pressure. If an agreement is not doable, then we will have to prepare uh, for a no deal. Uh, and this will then mean, at least at the beginning, that on the 1st of January, we will probably fall back on the WTO rules. This wouldn't be good for EU businesses, this definitely wouldn't be good for Irish businesses, but on the other hand, this would also not be good. It would actually be very bad for British businesses. And let me just compare, we will be exporting about 15% of our goods to the UK once the UK has left our single market, whereas 50% roughly of goods will still go to the world's largest single market. So it's actually more in the interest of the British side to get this agreement done. And I do hope that British industry and British businesses will point this out very clearly to the government and the negotiating team on the British side. Very good, David. Uh, just, uh, if I could just put you back onto, your, uh, onto German territory again, just momentarily, we'll, we'll switch back and forth uh, as appropriate. 
Um, but just the uh, the level of preparedness, and I think we've all been put on notice about the, the need to prepare uh, prepare adequately for a no deal or for all eventualities. In Germany, at least in my time there, it, it had already been factored in, uh, you know, that, that the Brexit was a reality and uh, people had begun to act accordingly. How concerned would people on the ground, in, uh, business people in particular, as well as politicians, obviously, how concerned would they be about a no deal uh, option? It's obviously... Uh, perhaps not as quite as, uh, as problematic or catastrophic maybe as it might be for us. Uh, but in Germany, c can Germany live with a, a no-deal uh, Brexit? Uh, and how, how inconvenient would that be? Well, the Chancellor, Angela Merkel, like many other representatives of the German government, has always made clear that we would prefer, of course, to reach a deal with the British. Of course, we want to put our future relations on a solid legal uh, basis. That is the way forward. But you might have followed uh, Angela Merkel's speeches in the Bundestag and also what she said on this issue in the European Parliament. She said uh, in the moment, she just cannot guarantee that we will find an agreement. Uh, and she's always been outspoken that she's in favor of an agreement She's ready to compromise, but it cannot be a compromise which will, in the end, violate fundamental principles of the European Union uh, and our single market. So as many other uh, member states of the European Union, uh, Germany has also stepped up its preparations for a no-deal outcome. The specialty in Germany is, of course, but it's not only the federal level which needs to prepare. It's also the lender level. And as the former minister president of Niedersachsen, which you mentioned, Michael, um, I know that, for instance, the government in Niedersachsen is also uh, stepping up the preparations. German industry has always been clear that they are very, very interested in having a as much as possible frictionless trade relation with the UK. But even German industry, the big organizations, BDI and BDA, have always said, we are fully aware if a country voluntarily leaves the single market and the customs union, things won't be as they were before. And German industry has also been clear that for us in Germany, it's important that the single market comes with four packages and that the four freedoms of the single market uh, it cannot be divided. Um, in your language, from well, the English language, you pick cherries. In the German language, we pick raisins, uh, Rosinen picken, but uh, to pick raisins in Germany is just as unpopular as picking cherries in Ireland. Very good. Um, can I just uh, put to you a question from, um, uh, from John O'Hagan, who's um, uh, from Trinity College here in Dublin. He says, is there any truth in the rumor, to the rumor, uh, that some in the quote-unquote inner circle at number 10 would be happy to have no agreement. Uh, I know you have a lot of contacts at political level in the UK, uh, that's just, I just uh, interjected that myself, but if this is so, is this a worry or will the EU simply accept that reality and move on? Well, I can't tell you anything about the inner circle uh, of uh, 10 Downing Street. Uh, I'm a German Christian Democrat, not a British Conservative. Um, I just do hope that everyone who is responsible in London knows exactly what consequences the one or the other decision would have. And I do believe it's better to have a deal than not to have a deal, that's for sure. The UK government is, has the mandate to negotiate for Great Britain and Northern Ireland and the European Union will try to convince our British counterparts in the ongoing negotiations what we believe would be beneficial for both sides but this has been stated so often and even though I don't dance I know that it always takes two to tango and we will have to accept um, any British position the high-level meeting on the 15th of June, and I was able to participate at this high-level meeting sitting next to the President of the European Parliament. This high-level meeting at least made one thing clear, that we 
cannot go on like we did after the third and the fourth negotiating round, that you have dozens of highly qualified experts sitting on both sides of the uh, digital uh, negotiating table, but there's no progress on substance in the political sensitive issues. This now requires a political leadership and it's up to the UK Prime Minister to take a decision whether he still is interested in getting this free trade agreement done. Our offer, as I mentioned, is unprecedented. Full access to the world's largest single market, but this requires that the existing standards of the level playing field are implemented and these standards now exist in the UK and I think they've been also beneficial for the people of Great Britain and Northern Ireland and that's why from our understanding this should be something the UK could be ready to um, accept. Uh, and a final point, don't underestimate the importance of fisheries. Uh, not all uh, EU member states uh, fish uh, in the North Sea, uh, in the Channel and in the uh, Irish Sea, but uh, we have been very clear also as a European uh, Parliament that uh, we want an agreement on fisheries to be a fully integrated part of the overall trade agreement we want to um, uh, get done with the UK. Um, fisheries is of huge concern, especially for the Netherlands, for Denmark and for France. And you have followed the last few days at the European Council in Brussels, how important the role is of these three countries. Indeed, and uh, I think also, if I recall correctly, it wasn't an issue that was, uh, to which Germany was indifferent either. I mean, despite the fact that the fishing industry in Germany would be a very small industry, uh, overall, I think it, 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 uh, some of it is within the Chancellor's constituency, our, our state, and um, you know it's not an issue without uh, political um, significance and, and moment in Germany as well. So you mentioned the three states, obviously Ireland as well, uh, uh, but obviously even countries like Germany, uh, it's just, uh, the fisheries issue is still a very, very sensitive political issue. We have free fishery, free fishing ports in uh, Germany where British fish uh, is landed. Uh, one is Cuxhaven, which is my home district. The other one is Bremerhaven, which is very close to my hometown. And the third one is Sassnitz. And Sassnitz in the Baltic is indeed in the constituency of Chancellor Merkel. So Chancellor Merkel uh, knows quite a lot about uh, how much British fish uh, is caught by German fishermen. It's actually, I find it still quite odd to give uh, fish uh, nationalities of human beings, but uh, I've learned now that we have to define what's a British fish, what's a German fish, and what's an Irish fish, sadly so. Very good, okay, can I just ask you a question? Um, it, maybe you touched on it in your remarks in any event, but from Neil Willoughby from the uh, IBEC, which is the Irish Employers uh, Federation, he says, thank you for your informative and clear presentation. May I ask you please uh, to comment on the issue of governance further? Uh, for the comment further on the issue of governance and outline if and where you see the potential for a compromise on this issue and on the role of the ECJ. Is there room for a compromise there uh, on the issue of governance on the ECJ? Well, as I mentioned, uh, one, an important point not only for the Commission but also for the European Parliament is that we want an overarching governance framework for the whole future cooperation with the United Kingdom. There isn't much appetite in Brussels for individual single agreements with individual single governance structures. Um, the European Court of Justice, uh, I mentioned in my presentation, um, attending the uh, high-level meeting in, uh, with Prime Minister Johnson on the one hand and Charles Michel, Ursula von der Leyen and David Sassoli on the other hand, I once again heard that the UK Prime Minister has totally ruled out any say of the European Court of Justice for British citizens and British businesses. 
Uh, now, we have to accept this position of the UK Prime Minister, and obviously this is not only his position, but this is backed by the Conservative majority in the House of Commons. But then we need to find a solution how we can find a dispute settlement uh, mechanism. And I was uh, clear in my presentation that the European Court of Justice is the sole interpreter of EU law and the law of the single market. And this is not a negotiating position. This isn't a bargaining chip. This is a constitutional requirement. So if we include in the agreement any kind of direct references to EU law, which of course would make things much more easy, then this, from my point of view as a lawyer, includes that then the Court of Justice, the European Court of Justice, is the only institution which can interpret uh, EU law. I think that's, uh, I mean, that's pretty much common sense. Now, if the UK uh, doesn't accept this, then indeed we will have to find a dispute settlement mechanism like we have with other, uh, 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 in other trade agreements, which will then be composed of uh, British judges on the one hand and European judges uh, on the other hand. But of course, also this kind of solution will have to respect uh, the impartiality and the independence of the European Court of Justice on the one hand, but of course of the British legal system on the other hand. So um, this is a tricky issue, but and it will make things more complicated, but if the British side completely refuses to accept any further jurisdiction coming from Luxembourg, then we will have to find an innovative solution. David, just the, um, I think um, even the UK may have been a little bit surprised about the cohesion and solidarity not of the 27 member states, um, not just in backing Ireland, but on, on issues in general in relation to the negotiating mandate. Um, has there been any evidence uh, at the level of the European Parliament of any kind of diminution or weakening in the solidarity, the cohesion of the Union? And to what extent would the UK ever have hoped to be able to get in behind um, uh, the, uh, or through to the individual member states and maybe uh, persuade them to, to, to break or to, 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 to weaken this solidarity? Is there any evidence that that solidarity is any less strong now than it was in 2016? No, I don't have this impression. I think the European Union has showed remarkable unity of the 27. And this unity was also a precondition for, until now, as um, keeping our position and to be very successful in these negotiations. Of course, we have to compromise and we need to find um, a consensus. Uh, the European Union had to make difficult compromises already as regards a withdrawal agreement uh, for, the EU, for the UK to leave the European Union. Um, so I still don't see any divisions between the member states. Uh, there's been a high level of cohesion. And for a good reason, I mentioned that the European Parliament's resolution was adopted with an overwhelming majority. Uh, in the end, it was only a few dozen colleagues who voted against the resolution and uh, 91 abstentions. This shows in the European Parliament that the European People's Party, the Social Democrats and the Liberal Renew and the Greens, that these four groups are fully supporting the line of Michel Barnier and his team. And if you look at the other groups, we had some support, some abstentions, some no from the, some votes against from the far left and from the conservative uh, parliamentary group. And the only ones who are against our report were the far right, which isn't really a surprise because um, most representatives of the extreme right wing parties in the European Parliament want their member states also to leave the European Union, or at least they're not interested in a strong European Union. If you look at parties like the Alternative for Deutschland or uh, the Lega from Italy or the Rassemblement from France. So now the European Parliament and the member states have 
shown full support. And that's why this vote in the European Parliament was so crucial because, of course, this vote was an indicator how far the European Parliament is still standing behind the negotiator. The House of Commons found worldwide attention in trying to pass the necessary legislation for the British withdrawal. The European Parliament was quiet in the first half of this match, but the European Parliament will have the final word on any agreement we find with the United Kingdom, and that's why the European Parliament's report on the ongoing negotiations in June is of course far reaching, and we might know that we won't be able to implement every single paragraph we adopted, but it's very well worth reading, not only in Brussels, but also in London, and issues like the implementation of the Irish Northern Irish Protocol or the implementation of the agreed citizens' rights are very, very important to colleagues, not only those coming from the Republic. Mm. I, I think uh, one of the um, concerns or among the many concerns, I suppose, would be that the agreement, whatever agreement is achieved at the end of the day, and people talk about very thin agreement being one of the op uh, possibilities there. That thereafter, you know, the whole um, relationship between the EU and the UK could be very, very, could remain very, very fractious and difficult, awkward, uh, temper t tempestuous indeed for quite some time to come. So even if you do get an agreement, there is the prospect, I suppose, for a long time to come of a very challenging relationship between the UK and the European Union, whether over the wider relationship or whether over specifically the Northern Ireland Protocol, which has many dimensions within it, which are obviously quite complex, quite challenging. So I suppose the concern would be, and just your comment on it, uh, even with an agreement, how, how messy uh, is the relationship going likely to be after the 1st of January? Uh, particularly, well, obviously, if there's a no deal, <laughs> it's going to be very messy. But even if there's a, uh, something better than a no deal, but a thin deal, uh, the prospect of a very, very difficult, awkward uh, partnership relationship between the UK and the European Union in the broad sense, but then specifically over Ireland as well. I'm not sure if you have the same uh, proverb or saying in the uh, Irish or, or English language. We say in, in, in the German language, uh, if you button a shirt, you have to get the first button right. Because if you don't get the first button right, you can continue buttoning the shirt and it will never uh, 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 be positive. It doesn't matter if you use rocket science or not. So the first button was, from my point of view, the withdrawal agreement, which was in the end, a decent compromise between both sides, which made possible that the UK could actually leave on the 31st of January uh, the European Union, the European institutions, but of course this was a Brexit, mainly in name only. And now the second very important button is now uh, the agreement on our future relations. But many, many more steps will then uh, need to be taken. Unsurprisingly, um, I always love to uh, quote my Chancellor, uh, Angela Merkel, who I've been supporting uh, all her political career, and I think she's been a fantastic leader uh, for our country. Angela Merkel said two or three days after the UK referendum in 2016 in the German Bundestag, uh, es gibt keinen Grund garstig zu sein, which would translate in English, um, there's no need to be nasty. She said, we're all sad that the British are, leaving the, are going to leave the European Union. We all regret this, but we have to accept this decision. And now we have to make the best out of it. And the British won't sail away to Newfoundland. They will remain where they are, exactly at the doorstep of the world's largest single market and with one land border uh, with the Republic. And we are in this together and perhaps even the harshest critics of cooperation with the European Union in London noticed in these last months what it means in these challenging times of a pandemic that you can get solidarity, that you can get support 
and that we're all in this together. This, that this pandemic has hit us all, but it hasn't hit us all equally hard. And that so many people uh, in Germany, like in Ireland, were so sad to see the high numbers of deaths uh, in the United Kingdom. And if the UK was still a member of uh, the European Union, the situation in the UK would have also played a crucial role now at the European Council when we were talking about economic support, the economic recovery plan. But okay, so to make it short, the UK will remain an important trade partner for us, an important, I know I have to be careful talking about this when I'm speaking to an Irish audience, but from a German point of view, also an important NATO ally. And we in Germany are fully aware if it comes to strengthening European defense and security cooperation, uh, we will uh, want to continue our close cooperation with our British allies and friends. By the way, that's another reason why I find it so unfortunate that the whole field of foreign policy, security and defense cooperation, has not been included. It's not part of one of the 11 negotiating tables, but this was once again a British decision. But perhaps after the 1st of January 2021, we could also put our future cooperation in these issues on a solid legal basis. Thank you, David. Uh, now that you mentioned Angela Merkel by name, um, let me just uh, digress a little bit um, and, and maybe bring you back on to German soil uh, and uh, a little bit on German politics, um, uh, as well as weaving in a little bit about the MFF and the uh, and the um, the next generation EU fund, uh, just um, and all we'll woven into one in the kind of the relatively limited amount of time we've we've left, maybe to cover some of these issues. But just um, Angela Merkel now is one year from from her uh, from her her, her intended uh, departure from German uh, politics. Uh, obviously, you know she's been at the helm for for so many years now. It's almost impossible for some of us to imagine what life was like before her. So Angela Merkel uh, will be leaving within the next year. Obviously, uh, elections, I presume, are scheduled for next uh, September, twelve months. Um, what is uh, what is the chance for legacy, uh, uh, if I may put it like that? Uh, bearing in mind, of course, the achievements of the last number of days, not the least of which involves the major grant um, funding that's going to be available to deal with the pandemic, which involves obviously the European Union or the Commission borrowing money, which again is almost heresy, I would have thought, from, uh, from a CDU point of view. But in any event, what is the, uh, the Chancellor legacy? And second question to that is, who is the next Chancellor going to be? Oh dear, well that's a very difficult question. Well, first of all, we Germans were following uh, and it's not always that simple to form a government and elect a new head of government in your country. I think Irish politics has hardly ever been so much on German evening news uh, uh, and, and Germans um, followed with large interest that for the first time the two competitive parties in your country have now uh, formed um, a, a coalition government. It's perhaps similar to when the Grand Coalition was formed in Germany which was also at the beginning you couldn't imagine that Christian Democrats and Social Democrats would sit in a government and now we've been sitting for so many years. Now the term of the German Bundestag will expire in autumn 2021, so Angela Merkel has another at least 15, 16, 17 months in office until her successor will then be elected by the German Bundestag. Angela Merkel is in a very special situation that she, for the second time in her career, is presiding uh, the presidency of the council. I mean, every 13 and a half years a country can manage this difficult task and Angela Merkel now has actually the possibility of doing this for a second time. And of course, this German presidency of the European Union will be an important part of her chancellorship. The expectations are high. Let me add, I think they're just too high. Uh, there are some people in Brussels who believe that everything that has been left over since 2015 could now be sorted out by the Germans uh, in their six months. No, no, this won't be the case. A presidency is always challenging. It doesn't matter if you're a small, a medium-sized or a large country. The main issues for the German presidency, apart from the ongoing EU-UK negotiations, will of course be the 
multi-financial framework for the next seven years and the Economic Recovery Fund. My impression is, and I was following just like you, the negotiations very closely in Brussels, that a remarkable achievement has been made. Who would have thought that just a few weeks ago, the European Union, the 27 member states could agree on such an hugely enormous package and considering at what odds the member states were when the council, when the summit started in, uh, on Friday. To put it in a nutshell, the EU summit compromise, from my point of view, the recovery plan is a positive step forward. And I think the European Parliament, which will be meeting for an additional plenary session tomorrow in Brussels, you will hear a positive echo from most of the MEPs on the recovery plan. We welcome this agreement, the 750 billion euros recovery instrument. But my take is not so positive yet for the long-term uh, EU budget. Why? Because I don't believe that the European Parliament will be ready to accept record low ceilings as they in the end mean renouncing to the EU's long-term objectives and a strategic autonomy. And this in times where citizens are asking for more. So if we talk, like in Ireland, like in Germany, about more European solidarity, more European action in health, public health, in research, in digitalization, in youth, or in the historical fight against climate change, or in more and closer cooperation on foreign affairs and even defense, then it is, from my point of view, to be criticized that key programs to reach these objectives have been considerably shrunk and lost most of their top-ups under next generation EU. So it's a mixed picture. The council will now face, once again, tough negotiations with the European uh, Parliament. But one thing is clear, we need to get an agreement before the end of this year so that uh, all participants of EU programs have clarity from the 1st of January onwards. So the council will now finalize its mandate to enter negotiations with the parliament. The negotiations will be quite uh, entertaining. Uh, parliament will set out its conditions and take up negotiations with the German presidency of the council of the EU then as soon as possible. But we need to get it done, the sooner the better. Excellent, just one final question if I may, and some for myself, just uh, you are, to what extent will there be a level of disappointment and concern in the European Parliament that there wasn't a stronger linkage drawn between the funding um, in the MFF and the rule of law issue? Uh, I mean, maybe that's inevitable that I would ask that question. Uh, uh, but I mean, I think there, there, there is a concern out there that maybe the, the outcome in the, in the end was weaker than, than many people who have, a, uh, who have concern about the rule of law issue might have wanted. Well, it's interesting how the agreement on the rule of law has now been interpreted quite differently. Uh, if you hear the statements from Budapest or Warsaw, they're quite different to what you're hearing uh, from uh, Paris uh, or uh, Berlin. Um, I'm pretty sure that this will play a major role uh, in the debates in the European Parliament. Um, the European Parliament, from my point of view, will remain firmly against watering down the mechanism to reduce or suspend EU funding if a member state disrespects the rule of law. This issue needs to be dealt with now. It shouldn't be put off. It needs to be addressed. It needs to urgently be tackled. And I'm very sure that the European Parliament will also be ready to enter into co-negotiations under co-decision to continue building, as I would call it, a European Union of fundamental rights and values. Because what we have to make clear to all 27 member states is we are definitely more 
but a free trade area and a single market. We are a union of values and a union of fundamental rights. And I cannot accept if certain standards regarding the rule of law are not fully implemented and not fully respected in certain member states. And this in the end must also have consequences for EU funding. Well, thank you very much, David. We're in the IEA, nothing if not efficient in terms of timekeeping. Um, it's now uh, four o'clock in Ireland. I know it's five o'clock where you are, but I just wanted to draw these, uh, this, this webinar to a conclusion, if I can, by just extending on behalf of a very extensive number of people who have tuned in to listen to us and to watch this afternoon, say thank you to you for, for bringing a perspective, which obviously is, is, is you know, you have you have that 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 that, that unique perspective in so many ways. But uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us uh, and the the views from within the European Parliament. We really do appreciate them. The issue remains, and all of these issues remain uh, deeply, deeply topical here. So we would look forward to welcoming you back uh, again at some stage in the future, maybe when we have after the first of January next year, greater clarity in terms of what the outcomes actually actually is. Well, thank you for inviting me and thank you uh, for the large interest, obviously, uh, this uh, event has found. And it was an honor, by the way, to have this conversation with you since you're one of the, or the longest serving diplomat in the history of the Irish Foreign Service. And let me add, you are an excellent representative of your great country in Berlin between 2013 and 2019. Thank you, David. That's a great note on which to leave you. Uh, so thank you very much indeed. Enjoy the summer break. And uh, thank you for the great work you're doing in the European Parliament. Thank you.